and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear Rosanna and John. It's our comedy podcast about death where two brothers, only one of whom is present, answer your questions, provide you with dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. My brother Hank is... Where is Hank? He's on tour right now. He's in his second week of tour. Wait, no, aren't I also on tour? No, you get dropped. You get dropped with the tour. Oh, right. That's right. I'm only on the first week of the Absolutely Remarkable Thing tour, and now I guess the second week is happening. So hopefully Hank is having fun on the road with lots of people who aren't me. Yeah, I hope so. Hey, did you bring a dad joke? I did bring a dad joke. Actually, it's my favorite joke of all time, which is a really great caliber of (laughs) you. Okay, bring it. Uh, What did the cheese say when it looked in the mirror? I don't know. Hello, me. (laughs) I mean, it's a it's a dad joke. (laughs) You've got some good news for us. I do. I have some great news. Rosiana, as you know, over the weekend, as we're recording this, not as it's being uploaded, you and I had the opportunity to see Taylor Swift in concert. It was so fun. That was the best. It was just magical. It was an incredible performance. We got to meet Taylor Swift. She's so nice. She's just like the most friendly, warm person. And I feel very gushy when I talk about her. And I've been kind of obviously telling the story over and over again to my friends and stuff as they ask me about the weekend. Um, And every time I hear myself talk about her, I I do sound like I'm a a child. But it's that level of, of warmth. Yeah, she also said, hey, I heard your brother has a book coming out. (laughs) So, Hank, Taylor Swift knows about an absolutely remarkable thing. So anyway, we were at the Taylor Swift show, and someone in the audience reminded me that the last time Taylor Swift came to town, I made a big deal about how the weather in Indiana became, like, magically perfect all at once. And again, the weather has been magically perfect several days in a row, pure sunshine, no clouds. It's been beautiful. And I'm visiting from London where it's really cold right now. So coming out to here, I'm really grateful to Taylor Swift for bringing her beautiful weather. So the good news is that wherever Taylor Swift goes, sunshine follows. I think that's pretty solid. All right. You want to you wanna, you wanna ask the first question? Let's answer some questions from our listeners. The first one comes from Thomas, who says, Dear John and Hank, I have friends who I would say excessively treasure their books. I personally like to see some damage on my books because it makes that book mine. When I look at a book I enjoyed and can see the time I walked into a corner of a desk with it, it feels personal. But my friends don't take their books out and keep them in protective covers. Is this a thing you do? I'm starting to feel like I don't treasure my things enough. Wallace and Thomas. (laughs) Do, Do you... Preserve your books and take the dust covers off and put them in special places? No. In fact, I just spilt a drink on part of the book I was reading. But Um, don't you also only own like 50 books at any one time, even though you're the best read person I know? (laughs) I do only keep 70 books there at the moment. Yeah. I try and keep 50 and then like 20 I'm currently reading that kind of go in and out. Um, But yeah, no, they're all trashed. They're all completely like ripped and torn. And I live with someone who does preserve all of her books very carefully. And she looks at me with horror. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good ways to read books, and I'm not opposed to people destroying their books, not least because it might necessitate the purchase of a second copy. (laughs) But I do, I I dog ear pages and I'll underline stuff if it's a book that I know I want to keep for a long time, but I do preserve my better books. I have a first edition of Infinite Jest that I read right when it came out, and I did this Like I made this present for my college girlfriend that involved me cutting up a bunch of pieces of paper and like writing reasons I loved her on the pieces. That doesn't matter. The point is that I instead I didn't have scissors. So I used like a box cutter to cut up the pieces of paper and I cut into this like mint first edition copy of Infinite Jest, which today is worth like thousands of dollars. And my copy is worth like 25 bucks. But it has that memory for you of that special moment. I'd rather have the money. <laughs> I think that for me, it, it kind of makes books into objects when you preserve them like that, rather than things that live with you and go around with you in your life. And, um, you know, I won't treasure that book any less for it having um, a bend or a tear in it, but it does make it less of a pristine object. And I guess for some people, it's about making them last. You know, like yeah. it, if my, if, yeah, again, my flatmate, Sana, she's very mad at me when I break all the spines of my books because she's like, well, now that book's going to be ruined and you can only read it so many times. Um, but I just read it in two parts. You can just have first half the book <laughs> and the second half the book. 
So when you like read a new favorite book and you only have 50 books in your permanent collection, do you like look, do you have in mind what the 50th book on the list is that, that the book that could go if a new favorite <laughs> supplants it? And did I write it? Those are my two <laughs> questions. I don't have a book in mind. Um, I do find that when I'm in the middle of a book that I'm really loving, I think I want to keep this book. Um, this will kind of, you know, this will go in the permanent collection or whatever. But then by the end of it, I just finished this book, The Idiot by Elif Batterman that I really loved. But by the end of it, I was like, I think I would more enjoy sharing this with someone than I would. And if I want to go back and reread it, I have a really great library nearby so I can borrow it from the library. Yeah, no, I think that my hoarding of books is a complete character flaw. It's not something I like about myself, but it's also not something I could stop doing. You could hoard worse things. All right, Rosiana, we have another book-related question. It comes from Johanna, who writes, Dear John and Hank, what's so great about Jane Austen? I'm an avid classic literature reader, and I love Twain, Hemingway, Ayn Rand. Just kidding. Thank you, Johanna. Steinbeck, etc. But I just can't seem to get a hold of the so-called genius of Jane Austen. Her books seem like courtships of rich British people. Am I missing something big? Not having any visions. Johanna. All right, so I think what makes Jane Austen novels special and extraordinary and the reason they've hung around so long is A, the quality of the characterization, which I think is unparalleled in English literature, and B, the fact that the books explore issues of class with such subtlety and such complexity and really such empathy. And I just don't find that in a lot of other places, especially in 19th century literature. So that for me is what makes her work special. But I also think, you know, Pride and Prejudice, for instance, is the kind of book that can be read critically over and over and over again. Like every time I go back to that book, I find something new. I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, I'm really biased because I'm a huge fan of Jane Austen. I've like reread her books over and over again. My favorite is probably Sense and Sensibility. Um, but when I was younger, I used to say that it was Emma because J.K. Rowling said that her favorite book was Emma. <laughs> so I was like, well, I will take that opinion uh, <laughs> and it'll be mine. Um, but for me, uh, the biggest thing I love about them is that social commentary, um, especially about what happens to women when their financial position is called into question. Um, in the time that Jane Austen published, she didn't have the rights. Women couldn't legally sign their own contracts, which is why she published those books anonymously. Um, and she was constantly kind of pointing out all these different parts um, of of the female experience, I think, and uh, while also doing some really cruel satire at points of the people in those societies. And sometimes uh, when there are lots of literature people getting around discussing them. There are arguments about whether she's upholding all these Regency values and playing into them with these kind of rich courtships and so on, or criticizing them. And that tension, that not knowing, I think is part of what I really enjoy still. Yeah, you said that way better than I could have. This next question comes from Laura, who says, Dear John and Hank, I just received an evite to an event described as elegantly casual. Can you decipher what that means? What exactly am I supposed to wear to an elegantly casual event? Elegantly, or perhaps casually, Laura. <laughs> Brilliant sign-off. Um, the dress codes are the worst. They're the worst. They don't mean anything. That especially doesn't mean anything. Like, what is elegantly casual? Does it just mean, like, expensive casual clothing? Like, this is a T-shirt, but it costs $200, so it's elegantly casual? We're going back to the Jane Austen thing and doing, like, ball gowns, but with trainers or something? Right. Like, I mean, I understand there? what casually elegant is a little bit, but I don't understand what elegantly casual is. Like, casually elegant is, I'm thinking, like, a, like a little black dress, simple but still fancy, you know? Like, so yeah. if you were a guy, maybe you'd wear, like, your best jeans, a button-down, and a blazer, but definitely no tie. Like, it takes you 30 minutes to get ready, not three hours. Right, exactly. But I have no flipping idea what elegantly casual is. Like, are you just supposed to wear, like, new sneakers? <laughs> Do they have to have, like, wings on them or something? Right. Yeah, it's okay. just, I, I, you should not go to this event, Laura. I mean, <laughs> this is not going to be a good party. Just don't go. My trick with dress codes, though, is to start with the second word, because I feel like the second word is the central part of the dress code. Okay. So, like, business casual or um, smart casual. Casual is a center thing. But then the word before it, which unhelpfully here is elegantly, um, modifies that a little bit. So if it's, like, smart casual, I'll wear a casual outfit, but with, like, a blazer on top of it or something. Mm -hmm. um, again, not quite sure what would make it elegant. Maybe a cape. 
Maybe heels. Oh yeah, maybe. So maybe you just wear like what you'd wear to the beach, but with your best <laughs> shoes. I love it. I'm not. I, <laughs> I think we've cracked it. Yeah, Laura, you came to the right place for fashion advice, and you got it. <laughs> so the next question comes from Leticia, who says, "Help! I'm going to a dinner party in the coming week, and the people there are friends with my friend, and they are known to banter, full on roasting a person until they're cooked into their basic components." I'm not witty. It takes me a couple seconds to collect what they have said and come up with a reply. But by then they assume they have already won. Not to mention how I was born in a house that spoke two languages and my pronunciation isn't up to par. All my friends say I'm smart and I'll be fine. But among these people, I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. In need of palm cards and a defibrillator, literature. P.S. We're all a bunch of 15-year-old teens. <laughs> that that PS is helpful because prior to that, I was imagining like a dinner party full of professional comedians who roast each other that you have to show up to. But no, these are just fifteen-year-olds. You'll be fine. You're gonna blow them away. I agree. I was I was imagining an elegantly casual dinner party, you know, <laughs> packed with people in capes and hats and beachwear. Um, but if it's fifteen-year-olds, it's okay. I'm very sympathetic to this situation though, because I don't, I don't feel like I'm a like a roaster at all. I can't come up with that like quick wit, um, and the idea of like going to a roast is probably my idea of hell. Um, but I do think that there is something to when you're in those friendship groups, being the person who says the kind thing, being the person who isn't cutting. I don't know. I absolutely agree. Like, if you're not confident in your roasting abilities, then lean into your <coughs> empathy and kindness. I have a group of friends in my neighborhood, and whenever any of the guys turn 40, we have a party that involves roasts. And I mean, I probably have worked as hard on the roasts that I've written for those parties as on anything I've ever published. But the people who are most successful at those events are always the people who make the difficult choice to be sincere. And who are sweet and kind, and when everyone else is being mean, they're like, you know what I like? I like that you're a loyal friend. Because <laughs> that's the curveball that no one saw coming. Exactly right. It's actually pretty easy to write jokes that criticize people and that make fun of them. There's a joke construction that I like to use. You look like blank, and blank had a baby. Um, so. For instance, my best friend Chris looks like Vince Vaughn and Vincent D'Onofrio had a 57-year-old baby. Um, He's like 20 feet tall. A 20-foot tall, 57-year-old <laughs> baby. It's, it doesn't work that well. Just stick with sincerity. I think those uh, dinner party situations can be so tense as well because you never really know what you're getting into. Yeah, but the thing you have to remember is that everyone else also feels a little tense and and, and nobody is actually paying attention to you. Like this is the central insight that my wife had when she was in middle school and that I unfortunately didn't have until I was like 28 years old. All the times that I worried that people were like, oh God, that guy is not as smart as the rest of us or not as, as, as quick-witted or whatever. What they were actually thinking was something about themselves. <laughs> You know, I mean, most of the time, most of us are thinking about ourselves. Like what they were actually thinking was, man, my stomach hurts or oh, I like I wish I could get rid of this eyelid twitch that I'm sure everybody is noticing that actually nobody is noticing. So you have to remember that everybody is also feeling a certain measure of anxiety as they approach this extremely exciting dinner party, which, by the way, just the fact that you're doing this, it means that you're miles ahead of almost every 15 year old in the world. I agree. All right, Rosiana, we have another question from Kimmy who writes, Dear John and Hank, I work at a grocery store that's open 24 hours a day. I generally work until 11 at night, and I like my job, but working that late means that I go to bed late, and then I have to get up really early some days to go to school. I'm in college, so it's not illegal to schedule me that late. After about 9.30, it gets really slow here, and I start to get tired, so I was wondering, is there any way that I could train myself to sleep standing up like a horse? Thanks in advance, Kimmy. <laughs> The best thing about sorting through Dear Hank and John questions at the moment is that Gmail has updated itself. And in Gmail's horrendous update, um, it has added three suggested responses to every single one of your wonderful Dear Hank and John questions that you're sending in. Um, so please do keep sending them in because Gmail is bringing me a lot of laughs. And for this, Gmail has suggested... All right. Uh, actually, can I read you the question and then you will read me Gmail's responses? Is there any way I could train myself to sleep standing up like a horse? 
Of course you can. <laughs> Is there any way I could train myself to sleep standing up like a horse? Yes, you can do that. <laughs> Is there any way I can train myself to sleep standing up like a horse? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kimmy, I regret to inform you that the answer is indeed no sorry. I think it's something about like paralyzing your limbs or something. That's why we can't sleep standing up. Yeah, I mean, some people can have moments of sleep when they're in extreme levels of uh, fatigue while they're standing up. But it's hard to have long term sleep when you're standing up unless you're being held on all sides by some kind of force, like in an extremely small room that's the size of you, which doesn't sound like a pleasant <laughs> sleeping experience anyway. Uh, so you are probably going to have to at least sit down. I used to. I have a little bit of expertise in this field, actually, because I've slept at a lot of jobs. I used to work at Steak and Shake uh, on the graveyard shift, and what I would do when the restaurant was empty is I would sit down at a table in the very back of the restaurant, and I would sit down at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I would put my head on the table. And do you know what bad things would happen as a result of me going to sleep, Kimmy? None. Nothing. It was fine. Nothing bad happened. When somebody came into the restaurant at 3.45 in the morning, they would come over and tap me on the shoulder and ask if I could take their order. And I would be like, yeah, of course. No big whoop. I feel like they're probably kind of expecting it. Truck drivers all over America like, are like quite used to waking up their servers and being like, hi. Yeah, totally. I, I think that, look, obviously in a perfect world, you don't sleep on the job. <laughs> but if you have to... Find a quiet place to sit. Even during your 15-minute breaks, maybe find a quiet place to sit if you can, assuming you get 15-minute breaks, which you're legally supposed to. Find a quiet place to sit, lean against a wall, and at least close your eyes. Give yourself a little bit of a break because it is really hard to work standing up late at night, go to bed, and find a way to shut off your brain fast enough to get enough sleep to wake up, to go to college. It's a lot. So get that rest where you can. I used to try and get songs stuck in my head on purpose when I was kind of between like the 9 p.m. and like 11.30 p.m. shift at, at Top Man, like the very mm. end of that of that shift in retail. And I would just get a song stuck in my head and would like aggressively sing it to myself for those last few hours. And that kind of worked, but then it made me hate those songs forever. Yeah, the only problem with that is that sometimes then you dream about the lyrics, or at least I do, and it feels like you've got a song stuck in your head even while you're sleeping, which can be annoying. But to get back to your question, Kimmy, I, I regret to inform you that it's going to be tough to sleep standing up like a horse. Speaking of music, we've got a question from Amelia on a similar note. Dear John and Hank, I listen to a lot of music, especially on my one and a half hour bus ride to school every morning. Every time I listen to Another One Bites the Dust by Queen, everybody I see walking out the window is walking in time. People step either on every beat, on every second beat, or halfway between each beat. Sometimes I find someone who isn't walking in time, but after a few seconds, they change to match it. I am very confused. Is this something to do with our heartbeat, or does everybody have an 80s disco playing in their head? Another one bites the dust, while the other one rides the bus. Amelia. That's a great sign-off, Amelia. It occurs to me, Rosihana, that as you and I are recording this, nobody in the world yet really knows about what a central role Queen the band plays in Hank's novel, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing. Oh, you don't know I either. I don't know that either. <laughs> I forgot that you haven't read the book. I'm really excited. Yeah, so I guess I can talk about this now. It's not really a spoiler because it's in the first 20 pages, but there is a very important part of the book that is contingent upon the Queen song, Don't Stop Me Now, which I'd never actually heard. I mean, I'd heard it, but it never meant anything to me until I started reading the book and now I listen to the song all the time. Here's my theory because I've been listening to a lot of Queen. It's not that everyone walks either on the beat or halfway between the beat. It's that there's the exact right number of beats to give you that illusion. That's my theory. I will say when I hear that song, Another One Bites the Dust, it is one of the most percussive pop songs I've ever heard. And so I think part of it is maybe that you feel the beat of it. You feel the pulse of the song a little more than you usually do in pop songs. I don't know. It's an interesting observation, though, Amelia. Related, you have a one and a half hour bus ride to school? <laughs> Sounds like a very long time. Every single day? Well, gives you time to listen to podcasts, I guess. I love it. But I do get that feeling when I'm listening to music. I look outside and I think, 
oh, everyone's walking in time. But then I just remember that I'm in the Truman Show and it's all <laughs> going to be okay. And that the whole world revolves around me. Right. Th- there, right. That is the other possibility that I hadn't <laughs> considered. That reminds me that Alice has recently gotten pretty into music, especially the artist Pink. Oh. It's Alice's favorite color and Alice's favorite musician. And one of the things that Alice says whenever a Pink song plays, like a song, a Pink, like anytime a Pink song comes on the radio or anytime I play one in the car, Alice immediately just shouts, It's my soundtrack! (laughs) And it is a wonderful thing to have a soundtrack, to feel like when you're just walking through your day, there is music that is, is accompanying you. I was thinking about that because it's a new experience. Like pre-Walkman, you couldn't have that experience. Like you couldn't, you couldn't feel like, it's my soundtrack <laughs> wherever you were walking around because you, you either didn't listen to music or you were forced to listen to music with other people. So. You had to wind up the gramophone and, right, yeah. and let it spin. Or learn to play the piano or something. Yeah, have someone follow you around with a massive piano. It's also another, <laughs> another great option. That's true, though. I, I remember one of the early stories that I used to write. I used to add in the soundtrack to the book as I was going, and I looked back and found some of them, and it was entirely Britney Spears. Like Really? Like 25 Britney Spears songs per story that was lifted from the Babysitter's Club. Yeah. Wait, you wrote Babysitter's Club fan fiction? Essentially, but I was also just plagiarizing. That is something I did not know about you. Yeah. Yeah. What, we both love the Babysitter's Club then. Yeah, very much. The Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High were like my earliest books that I read. I stole them from my sisters. They were also tremendously important in my development. I may have told you this before, but when I was in college, I had a huge fight with my college girlfriend. And I was like crying and inconsolable. And I read Claudia and the Sad Goodbye to make myself feel better. It's a heartbreaking story. It is. It's a beautiful story. And really, uh, listen, I haven't read the Babysitter's Club books in a long time. I think Claudia and the Sad Goodbye might have been the last one I read. But I read like 70 of them at least 10 times a piece. And they so deeply shaped my understanding of what stories can do and of what narratives exist for. My favorite was uh, the Island Adventure. It was one of those like special ones and they all get stuck on an island. And um, they have to fend for themselves for like a weekend or something. I loved that. Um, I also loved Boy Crazy Stacy. That was another solid classic. I think the Island Adventure one might have come out after my time. (laughs) But I love Desert Island books and I love Babysitter Club books. So maybe it's time. Hold on. I'm going to Google it. Babysitter's Club, Desert Island book. (laughs) Babysitter's Island Adventure. It's got three three point eight stars on Goodreads, which probably means it's great. I, I find that all the book, all my favorite books have three point something on Goodreads. Well, almost almost every book, right? Or two point something. See all buying options. It's available for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Bit pricey. Was Claudia your favorite then? Claudia was my favorite, but. I don't know. I am really, really excited to read the Babysitter's Club Desert Island book. That is right up my alley. It mixes my two favorite genres of literature. Well, you know what? Claudia is elegantly casual. Yeah, Claudia. Actually, just look on all the Claudia book covers, like all the ones where Claudia is the star, and you will see the definition of elegantly casual. In fact, I'm looking at the Babysitter's Club uh, super special Island, uh, the Babysitter's Island Adventure right now, and Claudia looks phenomenal. She looks super elegantly casual. <laughs> I don't know how we got on that topic. Weren't we talking about <laughs> Queen? But anyway, here we are. Let's move on to another question. All right, this one comes from Claire, who writes, Dear Brothers Green, I've recently dived into the world of tending to bonsai trees. I'm extremely happy and have great fulfillment in caring for these tiny trees and all the details required. I've done extensive research on their specialized care, and I've received many recommendations to join my local bonsai club, but I'm hesitant to attend a meeting. First off, I'm a college student, and by the looks of their newsletter, I would be the youngest person there by many decades. Also, I'm afraid that their expertise will embarrass me. There is so much to learn in this field and I'm just beginning. My tiny accomplishments, 
I get what you did there. I get what you did there, Claire. My tiny accomplishments are pinching leaves successfully, whereas many of them have 20 years of experience and 20-year-old trees. How should I approach this club meeting? Should I even go crystal clear, Claire? You should absolutely go. Yeah, you have to go. This is a high-quality learning experience, for one. You will learn so much about tending to bonsai trees, but I also think it's really fun to go into things that you don't know everything about and also things that are intergenerational. I think too often now we kind of hang out with people who are our age and we don't really have that many opportunities to meet other people from our communities um, and local clubs are such a great way to do that. I, I totally agree. Look, there's a tiny percentage chance that you're going to go to this thing and all of the people are going to be super rude and the group is going to be extremely insular and you won't like it and you'll never go again. But the overwhelming majority of the time, what's going to happen is that these people who have been hanging out together for 20 years and who are all 75 years old are going to be so flippin' psyched to find out that there is a young person interested in bonsai trees. It is going to make them so happy. They will love hanging out with you. You will learn from them. Their wisdom, not just about bonsai trees, but about everything, will become a part of your life moving forward. I think it's so, I totally agree, it's so important to have intergenerational friendships. And there really aren't that many opportunities for them outside of workplaces. So I think it's super important. When I look at my life, it's people who were a generation older than me who really helped me the most in my, not just in my career, but in terms of becoming the person I became. And I think something I read in your um, email is this fear that you have nothing to offer them, that you kind of, it's only their expertise and kind of you, this inexpert person. Um, but from the sounds of it, I feel like you could improve their newsletter for one. <laughs> You have skills that you can bring to the table too. And if it is all people who have done it for 20 years and their trees are all 20 years old, they may have forgotten how to talk about the new experience of beginning it. And I'm sure they'll really enjoy and relish having that like early experience of bonsai tending revisited. Yeah, that's the other thing I'd say, Claire, is that there's a pretty good chance that you are going to find a novel or a movie out of this story. Like, it's such a good setup for a novel. Like, you meet someone who's 40 years older than you and who is, you know, like a font of wisdom and then you, uh, they die, you know, at the end of Act 2. But then it turns out that you're stronger than ever. Just like the little bonsai tree you have learned to tend for. I mean, we already wrote the movie for you, Claire. Which reminds me that today's podcast is brought to you by bonsai trees. Bonsai trees, they're, they're so little. This podcast is also brought to you by Jane Austen. Jane Austen, with her acerbic wit and acid directions, she'll cut you down. <laughs> Today's podcast is also brought to you by Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. Another One Bites the Dust. It's your soundtrack, whether you like it or not. And finally, today's podcast is also brought to you by Gmail. Gmail. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> yes, that sounds great. I, I, every time I read a short email now, I assume that Gmail wrote it and my feelings are hurt. <laughs> like, we've become cyborgs. As you know, I've given you this rant already, but I'm worried that we're already cyborgs, Rosiana. The ship has sailed. I'm very frustrated that it keeps telling me to say yes to things when I'm trying to say no to them as well. Like, it often it won't even give me a no option. It will give me three yes options. Yeah, it's like Google also has a hard time saying no. <laughs> it wants me to put things in its calendar. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. If you don't have like a densely scheduled life, you might not need your Google calendar as much. And then they can't serve ads to me. And then they're deciding what we do with our lives, what we look at, what we value. Moving on. I'm upset. <laughs> All right, all right, this next question comes from Aiden, who writes, Dear John and Hank, as a high school senior, I am currently in the process of being swallowed whole by the college application process. As part of this, I have to write a lot about myself, something that I'm not great at, mainly because I really don't want to come across as obnoxious or overconfident. How do you draw the lines between not having enough self-confidence, having the right amount, and being a jerk? Oh my god, I'm learning. Aiden. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think it's so hard to apply for college or university because you really have to sell yourself. You have to go hard on like, here are all the best things about myself. And you have to do it kind of shamelessly, to be honest. Yeah, right. You have to make the case for yourself, which also involves making the case that you're not the kind of person who makes a case for yourself. It's so meta and difficult. My wife wrote the most amazing college essay. Sarah was an amazing student in general, but the college essay that she wrote 
was just phenomenal because it was about all of these things that she had done and all of these things that she hadn't done and how she wanted to go to Northwestern so she could do all of the things that she hadn't done. And so it didn't come across as overconfident at all. It was like, I've done this and this and this and this and this, and I may have gotten great grades, and I may have volunteered at this place and that place, but I haven't yet, you know, learned about 20th century women artists doing self-portraits or whatever. It was such a good essay. Like, even today... I couldn't write that good of a college essay. So, Aiden, just uh, steal that idea from Sarah. <laughs> I think that's a good approach. I, I can tell you some things not to do. Hmm. Don't make lofty statements about truth, which is what I did a lot of. I, did, I just kind of, I felt like I had to imitate my idea of what a university student was like when I was applying for things like that. Um, and I also felt like I needed to give something really personal and kind of share something really close because then that's how they would know about you. But you have to remember that the people reading your essays have never met you before. They don't know about things that you do in your free time. They don't know about any of the ways maybe your friends would describe you. And that's another thing I'd say is ask the people around you how they would describe you and try and build something from that. Um, but yeah, I really do... I hope, like, start to inhabit this place where you start to believe, actually, I am really worthy of getting into this place. And um, often the things that you feel like can come across as obnoxious and overconfident are really just you giving yourself a really good chance. I would also say, though, I agree, but I'd add that it's okay if you don't get in to your dream school. And we hear from so many people who write into this podcast who are dev either devastated that they didn't get into their dream school, disappointed by the college that they're attending, or so overwhelmed with anxiety about where they're applying and whether they're going to get in and what that means for their future. And it is a big deal and a big moment. And I, I absolutely understand that. But at the same time, you don't know what your future looks like. You don't know really whether it's good news or bad news that you got into this college or that college or didn't get into this college or that college. I look back at my life and I don't think things would have gone as well for me necessarily uh, as they have if I'd gone to a school that was quote unquote better because I went to the right school for me. Yeah, and I, I was so devastated when I got... Well, actually, we knew each other then. I remember. Oh, I got rejected from Oxford, which was my, like... I'd spent the last, like, 10 years, like, fantasizing about going to that school. And I got the rejection two days before Christmas. And I was so upset. I dyed my hair red. I was like, I'm just going to rebel now. And then I stopped at dyeing my hair red because I felt like that was kind of enough for me. <laughs> um, but actually, it was probably the... It, what, well, I'm not going to say it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Obviously, it sucked. But it um, was a really good, like, pivotal point for me. Um, in learning what was important and also just kind of, you know, this really bad thing can happen that you're dreading, but things go on, you know? Yeah, your life goes on, but also you can get a good education at universities other than Oxford. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you did. It was okay. <laughs> well. Yeah, I for one am really glad that Rosiana didn't get into Oxford because I suspect if she had, then we wouldn't work together today. So I won the lottery. <laughs> Thanks, Oxford. Okay, we have a question here from Katie who says, Dear Hank and John, or John and Hank? John and Rosiana. I was friends with this girl, let's just say her name is Patricia, in most of my childhood years. However, we both went to different secondary schools and inevitably drifted apart. We were both quite popular in primary school, but my popularity has decreased to a whopping number of one friend, whereas her popularity rate has increased by a lot. She's beautiful, sporty and lovely. I'm the complete opposite. Out of the blue, Patricia invited me to hang out with her after three years of not speaking. This is a stressful situation enough, but she invited me to a theme park with her dad. It's going to be me, her, and her dad. I don't even know her dad. What if he's horrible? What if she's horrible? We have literally nothing in common, so what the heck do we talk about? I don't sing the song raw, Katie. Katie, have you checked to make sure that you're not inside of a young adult novel? I think we have to consider the possibility. It's just such a good setup, Katie. It's even better than Bonsai Claire's setup in terms of the narrative potential. You got to see this as an opportunity for a great story. Whatever happens, you've got a fascinating cast of characters here and an amazing setting in the form of an amusement park. 
I think it's perfect. I, the one thing I would say, the only thing that I, I would say is, is the bad thing about this setup, mm-hmm. or maybe it provides narrative potential, is that there's going to be three of them at a theme park. And most roller coasters, there's two people sitting by, side by side. Right. So right. you've got like the dynamic of who's going to sit next to whom. Or maybe it's a way into meeting a stranger at the theme park, befriending them, and having them come along on your journey too. There you go. The love interest. The love interest or the Merlin figure. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Dumbledore. (laughs) Dumbledore loves 80 miles per hour. He can't help it. This is great, Katie. You've just got to lean into this experience because whatever is going to happen is going to be fascinating. The closest I ever had to something like this, I was a huge nerd in middle school. And for some reason, I had one magical day ice skating with the two coolest girls at my middle school. They were so generous to me and so nice to me. They were never like this before or after, but they were so nice to me that day. They like held, I I couldn't ice skate for crap, of course, but they held my hands as we like ice skated around and it wasn't romantic or anything. It was just lovely. It was generous and kind. I don't know if their parents had told them to be nice to me, but it worked. And I honestly, that it like was a fire that burned in my center all through middle school. And so when things were bad, I would be like, well, at least there was that one time at the ice skating rink and maybe life will go back to that someday again and it did so maybe it's going to be that maybe it's going to be terrible but either way it's going to be a great story and the best thing about a theme park is there's no shortage of activities like there's no kind of empty time really because it's always kind of like should we go on the next roller coaster should we go get this strange plastic food like (laughs) there's always something else to do except for the six hours that you spend in line talking to each other but that is where you go deep, Katie. That's where you say, you know, maybe maybe on the inside, Patricia doesn't feel like she's sporty and lovely and super popular. Maybe she has some gnawing insecurities that she needs to talk to you about. Maybe her dad, hmm, I'm not, just not that interested in parents. <laughs> so maybe he can fetch the burgers. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, maybe he'll be sort of like blandly supportive, like the parents in all of my novels, but a little bit overly anxious. (laughs) That's my prediction. Or not there. Yeah, right. (laughs) Or or dead. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) you can have a great time. Or not. Yeah, you know, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Um, you You do need to go, though, because it's a great opportunity. I don't know what kind of opportunity yet. Please keep us informed about this, especially if you discover that you are inside of a YA novel, because that's a book I want to write. We are open to buying life rights from any and all of you. So true. It's a dollar a piece. By buying, we mean suing. (laughs) That's right. We already own Claire's life rights. We We claimed them. All right, Rosiana, we have a question from another Katie who writes, Dear John and Hank, this year, all I want for my birthday is a cordless vacuum cleaner. I've been there, Katie. Like, I want it so much I have dreams about it. Anyway, my problem is that I live with a roommate who is not willing to invest in one. And normally I don't mind sharing my things, but I'm already sharing more than I'm comfortable with her. And as she's extremely clumsy, she has also already broken several of my belongings. Am I being too petty if I don't want to share the hoover of my dreams with her? If she's not willing to go halvesies on it, should she still be allowed to use it? And if not, how do I tell her that she can't use my cordless vacuum cleaner? I feel silly, but this is really bugging me. Please help. Hopefully soon, cleaning cordlessly. Katie. Oh, you've got to have a conversation with her and address it up front. Yeah, I think this is a communication moment, Katie. It sounds like some resentment has maybe built up a little bit. I suspect that this isn't really about the vacuum cleaner. It seems like it's about like a bunch of other things that include the vacuum cleaner. My feeling with vacuum cleaners, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Rosiana, is that if somebody wants to use a vacuum cleaner in my house, they are welcome to. (laughs) No. (laughs) If it's a Dyson, this is what I feel like she's implying. I feel like Katie is buying a Dyson cordless vacuum cleaner, which costs hundreds of pounds. Yeah, I don't know. Is that like uh, five bucks? (laughs) Not in this economy. (laughs) I guess what I mean is this. If someone would like to clean a mess in my home, they are welcome to. And I think... 
it is a little weird if you have a vacuum cleaner in a two-bedroom apartment and you're like, this vacuum cleaner only vacuums this half of the apartment because you wouldn't go have these on the vacuum cleaner. Like, it's probably technically within your rights, but I don't think it's going to lead to like a healthier roommate relationship. But it will lead to you having an operating vacuum cleaner. I guess, yeah, then they won't break your vacuum cleaner. That's the upside. The downside is that, like, people are going to come over to your apartment and be like, hey, so uh, what's up with the uh, weird line in the rug? And you'll be like, oh, no, I, I only clean this half of the apartment. And then I stare from my half at the apartment at my flatmate because they broke my uh, cookie jar 14 years ago and I haven't gotten over it yet. You seem to be saying, like, that's unreasonable. I think that's perfectly healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess to be fair, it's been a long time since I was in a non-spousal roommate situation. But when I was, I'll tell you, I was so happy if anybody (laughs) wanted to vacuum anything. Like, go right ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, man. The, The common rooms in my apartment were always very well kept. But my particular room was filthy, not just messy but actively dirty, like nine-month-old remnants of Big Mac's dirty. Oh, God. Yeah. So maybe allow that person to borrow your vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Um, But I think that there is a a way through this. You sit down with your roommate and you say, okay, I understand you're not wanting to go halvesies. Well, you don't really understand, but like, let's pretend you understand on this vacuum cleaner. Let's set some ground rules for how we're going to use this vacuum cleaner. Here are the ground rules. I mean, I, is that too much? That, that's a, it would, Am like, I if, if you sat me down and you were like, "We need to set out some ground rules for the vacuum cleaner use," I would be like, "Shut the front door!" <laughs> if oh I God, wanna, I'm the worst flatmate. If I want to use the vacuum, you're welcome. That would be my response. <laughs> On my first day living with Sana, we went around the kitchen and pointed out all the things that each other was allowed to use and not use. Wow. So wow. they were a little intense. I remember like three or four years after I moved out of my apartment with Shannon, she called me and she said, you know that uh, white computer? And I was like, yeah, I remember that white computer. And she said, it's mine now. (laughs) (laughs) So Different people. Yeah. uh, Yeah. You know, figure it out. Just communicate. That's the key. Okay, Roseanne, it's time for the news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon. I'll go first. AFC Wimbledon played Scunthorpe. I, you know, it never gets old saying the word Scunthorpe. What is it like living in a country that has place names like Scunthorpe? Well, you pass them on the train and then you wave at them and then <laughs> you ask, you ever, where are you from? And they say Scunthorpe. Have you ever been to Scunthorpe? I haven't, actually. Well, it, it seems lovely based on uh, the stadium. Uh, AFC Wimbledon lost 3-2, to two, a scoreline that, based on my viewing of the game, rather flatters Wimbledon. Uh, the two goals that we scored were pretty good. Kwesi Apaya scored one. Liam Trotter scored one. Nice to see Liam Trotter get on the score sheet. But, oh, God, we gave up three really horrendous, frustrating goals. So now AFC Wimbledon are down to 16th in League One, eight points after eight games, a negative five goal differential. It looks like even though we have mostly different players from last year, at the moment at least, we have a similar team. Uh the important thing is to stay up. That's all that really matters. I just want to. I just want to stay up, get into the new stadium. Sixteenth is a completely acceptable finish, but oh god, it would be nice to win a couple games. Just feels better. Feels so much better when we win. Yeah, it really does. The one thing that I will say is that Sunderland, despite having a parachute payment from being in the Premier League two years ago that is something like 35 times larger than AFC Wimbledon's entire playing budget, are only in fourth. (laughs) So... You'd be surprised. Well, as you know, I went to see the West Ham. My my two teams, West Ham and AFC Wimbledon, play each other in the Carabao Cup. Quality, quality cup. Um, And for me, it was, you know, a whole 45 minutes plus thinking, oh, AFC Wimbledon are going to win this despite the fact that um, their budget is minuscule compared to West Ham's. Yeah, no, I, I also thought in the first half, Wimbledon looked like the better team. Yeah. In the end, 
uh, playing with 10 men against uh, the 11 of Premier League for this season anyway, West Ham. Was a little too much, but yeah, I mean that's the thing. Wimbledon at several points this season have looked really, really class, including pretty good against Sunderland. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's just, can we put some results together? We shall see. What's the news from Mars? Well, the news from Mars is more like an article about Mars. There okay. was a, a really great piece in the um, Atlantic that came out over the weekend by Jeff Manach, whose name I'm sure I'm pronouncing. Perfectly. Um, All about how Mars will be policed and how uh, murders and things will be solved and created on Mars, which reminded me that a lot about the Mars discussion is actually this like philosophical thought experiment about how we can create a optimum society when we're bringing all of our biases to Mars. But some of it was also about how DNA will leave, um, will have a shorter lifespan on Mars or a different lifespan on Mars, how splatter patterns will be different, how depending on whether the body is exposed to winds and weather, it will be, the bones will be bleached or not. I went quite deep here when I was reading about it. (laughs) It's very positive, but I feel that this is a podcast about death, so you guys can handle it. Um, There was a further discussion. There is a researcher who has created this optimum space prison, which you might think is actually quite dark. But part of what he was doing is making it possible um, for oxygen supply to continue, regardless of how the guards were feeling towards the prisoners, so that there are basic life rights and responsibilities and so on. And a lot of this comes back to where nations start and begin, who has authority over which parts of Mars, and um, All sorts of different discussions that I hadn't even thought about all collapsed into one little article. So that's how Mars will be policed, and that's on The Atlantic. Um, I will send a link to the Patreon as well. That is really interesting. And it reminds me of this great PBS digital show, America from Scratch. Have you seen it yet? Um, It's really good. It imagines, for instance, if we were forming the United States tomorrow, would we have states? And if so, would the lines for the states be where they are? Of course not. Of course, North Dakota and South Dakota would not be two separate states. Uh, But it imagines all of that stuff. If we were starting from scratch with the United States, what would it look like? And I think that's such an interesting intellectual exercise because obviously we have to work with the traditions that we've inherited, but at the same time we have to innovate. And I, for one, would love to read a murder mystery set on Mars. Well, there's apparently a Mars trilogy of some sort. I oh, don't know. Oh, yeah, that's Hank's favorite book. Oh, is it? Do they have Do they have murder mysteries and I just haven't read them? I don't know. Okay, well, yeah. we'll investigate that further by talking to Hank. <laughs> Rosiana, thank you so much for potting with me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It's been so much fun. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening as well. If you want to email us, you can do so at Hank and John at gmail.com. You can also find Rosiana on Twitter occasionally at, uh, what is it these days? Rosiana Rojas. And I'm also occasionally at John Green. Where else can we find you on the internet? Well, I have a podcast with my friend Lex called Make Out With Him. It is a friendship, romance, and kissing podcast, um, but we often just go off on tangents about... I don't know, Prince Harry most recently. Very, very fun. Um, I also have a YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Rosiana, where, again, I upload periodically, but I wouldn't say regularly. Yeah, that's the case more and more with more and more parts of the social internet for me these days. But that's a different podcast called Delete This with Hank and Catherine. (laughs) I heartily recommend Make Out With Me, by the way, especially if you like advice podcasts with lots of tangents. And if you're listening to this one at this point in the podcast, you do. So uh, check that out. Thanks again for listening. This podcast is produced by Rosiana Hals-Rojas and also by Sheridan Gibson. It's edited by the brilliant Nicholas Jenkins. Our head of community and communications is Victoria Bongiorno. You can find us at patreon.com slash Dear Hank and John. The music that you're listening to right now and at the beginning of the podcast is by the great Gunnarola. And as they say in our hometown, don't Don't forget forget to be be awesome. awesome.